Let's pray together. God, we pause in this moment to adore you. Thank you for your steadfast love and faithfulness. Thank you for the ways that your faithfulness is revealed in the stories that we have been exploring through this series. But thank you too for the ways that you reveal your faithfulness in our own lives. We take a moment to rest in your faithfulness this morning. Together, Lord, hear our prayer. God, we're so grateful that you've given us the Bible, this amazing book that tells the story of your faithfulness to your people through all generations. We thank you that it reminds us that you are always calling us to return, to find ourselves again in the stories and to lean again on your unfailing love for us. We ask that you would ignite in us a desire to understand and know the Bible. That you would give us curiosity, that you would help us to wrestle with what it says and how it invites us to be transformed. And as you reignite in us this desire, we ask that you would use scripture to meet us face to face, to give us a new perspective on ourselves, on our community and on the world. We ask for the courage to respond. Together, Lord hear our prayer. Today, God, we bring our needs and the needs of our world to you. As we look at our lives and the state of the world, we can see that there are so many places where we need your faithfulness to be revealed and where we need to ask for eyes to see your faithfulness. You are the one that keeps our storylines going, and so we ask for your help. We ask for provision and peace and healing in our lives and in the lives of those we love. We ask for your guidance and direction as we look for a new lead pastor. Prepare us as a community for whatever comes next. And we ask that you would bring your peace and protection in areas of the world where there is chaos and suffering. Together. Lord, hear our prayer. God, would you form us as a community that responds to and lives in relationship with you? Your word is a window that reveals you. It continues to call us back into relationship with you. It is the way that you show us what you are up to in the world. And so as we listen to what you have to say to us this morning, would you give us open hearts? open ears. Would you draw us into the grand narrative of history revealed in the scriptures? Amen. So as you know, we've been focusing on a spiritual practice each month, and this month's spiritual practice is prayer. Last week we talked about confession how telling God the truth about how we've gotten it wrong, about our sin, leads to the truth that we are deeply loved and already forgiven. Confession leads to freedom and transformation. Now, prayer can take out 
take on all different forms in our lives. We could talk about prayer all day and never get to the end of it. Um, but we can find a fruitful practice that helps us for a long time. And then sometimes we can find that it doesn't really work anymore. That It's not fruitful for us. And that doesn't mean that God has abandoned us or that we are unfaithful. It might just be an invitation to try a new practice of prayer. And one way that I have found really helpful um, to pray when old ways of praying feel like they've fallen by the wayside or my prayers feel like they're hitting the ceiling is praying scripture. Adele Calhoun says this, when our prayers seem to be more about maintaining control and offering God our agenda for his stamp of approval, Praying scripture can return us to a simpler state of openness and attentiveness to God. Now, there are all kinds of ways that you can pray scripture. You've heard me encourage you to dig into the Psalms and find words that just resonate with you or echo your experience. That's one way to do it. But Paul has some beautiful prayers in the New Testament letters. And of course, Jesus teaches us how to pray in the Lord's Prayer. So that's a great place to start too. But today I want to focus a little bit on Lectio Divina. So Lectio Divina is an ancient practice of praying scripture. Um, and this is what it, it, it is. It's kind of like taking a passage of scripture and then chewing on it or meditating on it. Uh, some people sort of talk about it like a cow chewing their cud. They come back to it again and again and again and just uh, think about it and turn it around in their mind. And as we reflect, we ask God to tend to us and to speak to us through the words. So here are some simple instructions for Lectio Divina. And you do this process slowly when you have lots of time. You can sit with scripture for a while. First, read the passage. Notice any phrases or words that stand out to you. And then spend a couple of minutes dwelling on that word or phrase. Then, read the passage again. And as you read, spend time pausing and reflecting on the phrases or words that have caused, caught your attention. And then ask God to reveal to you situations or experiences in your life to which those words apply. Read the passage a third time. Ask God to reveal if there is something that you are being asked to do in response to your reading. And finally, read the passage one last time and rest in the words, thanking God for being present with you through your prayer. And you can take a picture of this with your smartphone if you're interested, but if you want to come back to it, it's also on our Spiritual, spiritual Practices website at lakeviewchurch.com if you want to come back and revisit it again. So there's your challenge for this week. Pray scripture. Try Lectio Divina. Okay, let's jump into a few announcements. So next weekend is a big weekend here at Lakeview Church. We're celebrating believer baptisms on Sunday morning along with child baptisms and dedications. So please join us. Uh, but we're going to start off this big weekend with an on-site on Saturday uh, at 2 p.m. We're making Advent wreaths in preparation for the Advent season. And all of you are invited, uh, no matter what age or stage of life you're at. And uh, you can sit with your family or you can sit with friend groups. And you'll learn a little bit more about the Advent season. And take home an Advent wreath with scripture readings and practices to help you and your family mark the season of Advent. It's going to be awesome, and it's filling up quickly, so if you want to come, I suggest that you sign up today. Next week, we also have our annual general meeting happening after the Sunday morning service, so please plan to hang out with us and join us so that you can be a part of the important work of doing the business of our church, and you're all welcome. Uh, an update on buckets of thanks. So yesterday, about 50 amazing Lakeview folk took shifts at the MCC offices to pack buckets. It was an amazing day, and here are some pictures. You'll see we had all ages and stages of people. Lots of great help. It was a great day. And our goal was to raise $3,000 through your donations and then match it with $3,000 from our community care fund. And I'm pleased and grateful to announce that we raised $3,007. So we were able to cover the cost of all of the kits that we packed. 
So thank you, thank you, thank you for your generous spirit and cooperation. Uh, we don't see the people who unpack these buckets, but we were reminded yesterday that they're very, very important and vital for people who are lost in the chaos of war and displacement. And so this is just a small way that we can join with God uh, to look after the people who need it most. So thank you so much for your generosity. Um, at Lakeview, we care about creation, and we know there are lots of ways that we can be more green, and we think it would be great to have a green team here at Lakeview, and it turns out that someone else in our church feels the same way, and so I'm going to invite Penny out here to join me on stage, and Penny, you had a great idea for our church. Can you tell us about it? I noticed that our church building had a garbage but not a compost. We have the compost at our home and at my school. Composting is good because if you throw if you throw food in the garbage, it will end up in the landfill. But if you put that food in the compost, it will turn into dirt to help feed our earth. I pointed this out to my mom, and she said to write a letter to like future staff. That's so great, Penny. So you think we should get a compost and you think that we should also get a team together to work on this, don't you? Yes, I would like to get a team to gather and talk about different ways that we can help Lakeview be more green and do a better job of taking care of creation. What a great idea, Penny. If anyone else would like to join Penny, yes, let's give her a, a hand. Well done, Penny. If you would like to join Penny as part of our green team, you can uh, find her in the lobby. She'll be out there to discuss it with you after the service. Uh, you can also email serve at lakeviewchurch.com or you can fill out a connect form on our website to let, you know that, let us know that you're interested. Thanks, Penny. If you're new to Lakeview and you would have any questions or you'd like to connect, you can go to that form and fill it out and send it our way and we'll connect with you. And finally, um, if you call Lakeview Church uh, home, we invite you to give and support us financially. And you can do that by visiting lakeviewchurch.com slash give or texting 84321. And thank you for the ways that you support us. I'm going to invite Carissa out now to share with us this morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm just giggling because I dropped one of my Bibles on the way out. Thanks, Kurt. Um, good morning. Welcome to a snowy Sunday morning. Um, I got to do one of my favorite things this morning, which is bring a stack of books with me. Um, here they are. Um, welcome to the next installment of our Restart series. Uh, where we're talking about characters in the Bible who had to restart. And we're almost done with our series. I'm told that Advent starts in two weeks from today. How did that happen? Um, so today we're going to get acquainted with Josiah, one of the many kings of God's chosen people, and one that is remembered by the writer of Chronicles as the ideal king. Uh, I wonder why. And one of the characters in Josiah's restart is actually the Bible, or the book of the law of the Lord, as it was known then. So as you can see, I've brought some Bibles with me today. These were all the Bibles that were in my house, um, and they each kind of have their own story. I received them at different times. They do different things for me, even though they're all the Word of God. Um, so let's start here at the bottom. I have this message version. This is, I think, a New Testament and Psalms and Proverbs. I think I asked this for this one for Christmas one year and got it. Um, it's kind of bulky. It's not one I carry around very often. This one I carry around even less. This is my hefty NRSV study Bible. This is my preaching Bible. Um, this is where I start with my sermons. Oh, look at that. I even left my tabs in there. Okay, and then let's move along. I've got this lovely leather-bound ESV with my name on it. 
Yes, you all very impressed, no? I got that one for finishing the credentialing process at YFC Canada. And then I've got this cute little NLT. This one belonged to my mom, and then I think she overheard me saying I needed an, a nice, cute little Bible to travel with for work. So you know how moms get. They just give you things. They're nice that way. Um, <laughs> and then I have this one. This is my, like, tried and true. This was my everyday use Bible for a long, long time. Um, as you can see, it's full of papers and memories and sticky notes. Um, this is the Bible I still go back to if I have a verse in my head, but I can't remember where it is. I go back to this one because I actually remember where it is on the page sometimes. Um, so this one comes in handy for that. Um, <clears throat> so lots of Bibles. Now imagine, imagine that I just had one. Just had one Bible. And it was one of very few copies in existence. Um, in this area. And maybe in one of the many moves that I've made in the last 10 or 12 years of my life, maybe I misplaced it. And do you ever do this when you move? You tuck something in a box with a bunch of other odds and ends, and then the box somehow disappears in your house somewhere, and you, and you forget that you have it. Maybe this Bible ends up in that moving box with a pile of other things and it's only years and years later, or maybe even generations later, that someone finally goes through my things, empties out all the closets, the nooks and crannies, and finds the box that it's in. And because it's, it's one of only a few copies around, the, the person who finds it, the Christ follower who finds it, is reading it for the first time. It's the first time they've actually held it in their hands when they've heard the word of God. Hmm. What would that be like? This is kind of where we find Josiah in our text today from 2 Chronicles 34. King Josiah discovers the word of God in written form and what it has to say about the moment he finds himself in. So we're going to spend a bunch of time in the world of the text today, which I'm going to warn you gets a little tense as it often does. Um, and then we're going to talk about the world in front of the text, this world that we're in, this snowy Saskatoon morning. And we're going to talk about what message Josiah received and acted on that still matters for us. So let's meet Josiah. Josiah is one of the kings of Judah, so of the southern kingdom. Remember that Israel starts out as one, and then at a certain point, it divides up into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Josiah is a king from the southern kingdom. And by the way the text introduces him, we can already tell that he's going to be one of the good ones, because this is what it says. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. He reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his ancestor David. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. Josiah is presented as the ideal king. Not only is he one of the ones who did what was right, remember, not all the kings are introduced that way, but he's likened to King David, the man after God's heart. And the text gives a third qualifier. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. And this is one of Scripture's kind of brilliant ways of leaving breadcrumbs. This is a phrase that appears several times before this, this idea of not turning aside to the right or to the left. Um, it appears in Deuteronomy in particular. So keep your ears open later on and see if you can kind of catch the connection. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. So Josiah is young, very young, but he's a good king. At the age of 16, he begins seeking the God of his ancestor David. He's studying, he's learning. And at the age of 20, jo Josiah is doing the good kingly thing. He's purging the land from idol worship. And then he orders the repair of the temple, the temple of God, which is going to be expensive. 
And so while the money chambers of the temple are being emptied, things get interesting. Let's read what happens. While they were bringing out the money collected at the Lord's temple, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord that was written by Moses. Hilkiah said to Shaphan, the court secretary, I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. Then Hilkiah gave the scroll to Shaphan. Shaphan took the scroll to the king and reported, Your officials are doing everything they were assigned to do. The money that was collected at the temple of the Lord has been turned over to the supervisors and workmen. Shaphan also told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a scroll. So Shaphan read it to the king. When the king heard what was written in the law, he tore his clothes in despair. So Josiah is still a young king when this, this dilemma moment occurs in the rising action of the plot. It is a moment that demands Josiah's action. So what exactly was Josiah hearing that makes this a turning point in the action? What's got him so worked up? Well, the book of the law here is referring to what modern scholars agree was likely an early version of the book of Deuteronomy. And because the hearing of it causes Josiah to tear his clothes in despair, which is a sign of, of genuine repentance, we can assume that what he is hearing reads like a threat. So, how excited are you that I've mentioned Deuteronomy? No? Not usually a crowd favorite. Well, <clears throat> it's actually one of my favorites because it's an epic speech. It's quite possibly the world's longest farewell, um, but it's a message from Moses to the Israelites just before they enter the Promised Land. So imagine Moses and the Israelites, their whole camp is stopped at the side of the river just before they're going to cross over into the promised land. And Moses says, okay, everybody stop. I've got a message for you. And Moses, while verbose, doesn't mince words. He doesn't, he doesn't pull punches. And without getting lost in all the details of his message, I'll just summarize it this way. When Josiah hears the words of Deuteronomy, he knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that God's people are in violation of the covenant with Yahweh. Sound familiar? They have broken the laws of God again. And because they haven't upheld their end of the covenant terms, they are susceptible to the curses written in the book of the law. And remember, for the people of Israel, survival depended on God's presence with them, with God's help to them in battle. And at this time in their history, the other nations are on their doorstep. The northern kingdom of Israel has already been defeated by the Assyrians. They need God on their side. And the way they know if God is on their side is if both sides are upholding their end of the covenant terms. We can't move around in the Old Testament very far in any direction without bumping into covenant theology. Covenant is the story of God. God, Yahweh, willingly gives his name to the people of Israel. They are called by his name. But God expects the people called by his name to worship and be faithful to him alone. Early on in God's covenanting with the people, there's failure. We remember this, right? Literally, as Moses descends the mountain with the commandments, the stone tablets, the people have strayed. So God sets out the terms of the covenant. This is what I will do as your God, and this is how you must live as my people. The law, the Torah, is the way of life that sets 
people, the people of Israel apart. It sets them apart, making them worthy to be carrying the name Yahweh. God says, because if you, my people, don't act in a way consistent with who I am, then people around you are going to get the wrong idea about who I am. And once again, in Josiah's time, the people are failing to stay faithful. And Josiah, in hearing God's words written in the book of the law, he's feeling the weight of their disobedience. Josiah has reached the dilemma of his kingship. And it has come as he encounters the word of God, the book, the Hebrew Bible. And he faces the same question that Moses poses to the Israelites on God's behalf in Deuteronomy. Will you choose life or death? Obedience or disobedience? Blessings or curses? Repentance or continued rebellion? So let's step in front of the text for a minute here. Josiah's experience with the word of God is one of conviction, inviting repentance. John Golden Gay says it this way. Scripture had the opportunity to look Josiah in the face, and he knew how to respond to it. What about us? Have you had this kind of experience with the word of God? Do you read scripture with an intent to respond to God? To take action upon hearing what it says? Has anyone, um, has anyone ever attended an Anglican service? Anyone here has been in an Anglican liturgy? Maybe a couple of you. So if you have, did you notice that during the gospel reading, the whole congregation just spontaneously stands up? Have you noticed that? Do you know why Anglicans practice this in their liturgy? My sources tell me that the reason for this is that they want to be standing when they hear the Gospels read so that if they hear something that they need to share with someone immediately, they're already up and ready to go. Kind of neat, hey? Built into their liturgy is the expectancy that the Word of God will spur them to action. They embody that expectancy in their worship. I think that's really cool. And I've really had to think about this this week. Does God, through the voice of Scripture, have access to speak to my life, my patterns and my desires and my behaviors, my embodied reality? And am I standing at the ready to respond to what I hear? Is that the kind of posture you and I have when we read scripture? When the book is read to Josiah, maybe because he's already been seeking God and making reform, because he is the ideal king after all, Josiah hears and knows what he needs to do. Step one is complete. He's already responded in humility tearing his clothes and weeping, that genuine repentance. And then he springs into action. Josiah's second order of business is to inquire of the Lord for confirmation about his next move, which in his day meant finding a prophet, a prophet who speaks for Yahweh. And so the entourage that he sends out finds the prophet Huldah, who is at the ready with two words from the Lord. Huldah said to them, The Lord, the God of Israel, has spoken. Go back and tell the man who sent you, This is what the Lord says. I am going to bring disaster on this city and its people. All the curses written in the scroll that was read to the king of Judah will come true. 
For my people have abandoned me and offered sacrifices to pagan gods, and I am very angry with them for everything they have done. My anger will be poured out on this place, and it will not be quenched. But go to the king of Judah who sent you to seek the Lord and tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the message you have just heard. You were sorry and humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this city and its people. You humbled yourself and tore your clothing in despair and wept before me in repentance. And I have indeed heard you, says the Lord. So I will not send the promised disaster until after you have died and been buried in peace. You yourself will not see the disaster I'm going to bring on this city and its people. So they took her message back to the king. Kind of a good news, bad news situation, wouldn't you say? Josiah has been spared because of his repentance, but the God of Israel is going to send disaster on the city of Jerusalem and its people. So what does an ideal king do in this situation? Does he take his merciful free pass and leave the other bozos behind? Of course not. Then the king summoned all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem, and the king went up to the temple of the Lord with all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, along with the priests and the Levites, all the people from the greatest to the least. There the king read to them the entire book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. The king took his place of authority beside the pillar and renewed the covenant in the Lord's presence. He pledged to obey the Lord by keeping all his commands, laws, and decrees with all his heart and soul. He promised to obey all the terms of the covenant that were written in the scroll. And he required everyone in Jerusalem and the people of Benjamin to make a similar pledge. The people of Jerusalem did so, renewing their covenant with God, the God of their ancestors. So Josiah removed all the detestable idols from the entire land of Israel and required everyone to worship the Lord their God. And throughout the rest of his lifetime, they did not turn away from the Lord, the God of their ancestors. The covenant renewal is the climax of Josiah's story. And in fact, when you read the Old Testament, keep your eyes open for covenant. Anything that has to do with covenant, it's the crux. But it actually asked me, um, it actually caused me to ask a few awkward questions this week. If the prophecy confirmed that Josiah would be spared because of his repentance, why bother renewing the covenant and bringing all the people with him? He's in the clear, and especially since Huldah confirmed that disaster was inevitable. Why bother if Jerusalem's fate is already sealed? Let's dig in here for a bit and play this out. The covenant ensured God's presence and relationship was with the people. Without that assurance, life was just about striving and appeasing without ever knowing for sure. But Yahweh had made a way to know. And the law, the Torah, and the sacrificial system existed to help them know that God was still with them. But <laughs> you, you all know the craziness of Leviticus, right? Like the idea that all of those Levitical codes, the nuances of sacrifices that had to be made for each tiny infraction of the law, whether intentional or unintentional, it seems ludicrous to us doesn't it? We don't find and read any freedom in the law. But in a weird way, the law, the Torah, was actually designed for peace of mind. 
it laid out a, a high, high standard for the way of life God was expecting of the people who carried his name. But the systems of the law and sacrifices also created a fail-safe for what to do when you mess it up. Sin is accounted for in the law. It assumes that sin will exist, that the people will fail in their faithfulness to it and to the covenant and to God, but the law lays out the way to return. And it's the return that matters to God every time. The law says you must live this way and when you don't, when you mess it up, this is how you return and this is how you'll know that you're back in right relationship with God and with your community. Isn't that incredible? I did not realize the law was life-giving. So when Josiah, the ideal king, the example to all future people of God, when he hears the book of the law and then hears Huldah's confirmation, he knows that returning to God is utmost. The returns are how the people know that their relationship with God is intact and that hope is still available to them. If the people return, if they repent, God will be faithful. That's the covenant promise. That's why Josiah calls for the renewal of the covenant. Disaster is looming large, and return is the only hope. Not to avoid disaster, that's coming. But to know that they have God's presence with them again. It's a restart. So, <clears throat> a few years ago, I was reading a bedtime story to my friend's daughter. Uh, she had brought a book home from the library, um, and it was a version of The Hunchback of Notre Dame. You know this story. But it was not the Disney version. So, in the Disney version, the hero, Quasimodo, puts an end to the evil villain and is welcomed out of hiding and into the community while Esmeralda gets to marry the love of her life. That's Disney. In this book's version, um, I wouldn't call the ending satisfying. <laughs> the villain, I think, still died, but Quasimodo had to go back into hiding, and Esmeralda had to flee the city in order to survive, and it was all a bit... Uh, you know, like surprising for a children's book. So we finish reading the story, and this eight-year-old just looks up at me and goes, huh. And that's kind of how the ending here feels to me with the story of Josiah and the kingdom of Judah. Huh. It's unsettling to have that promised disaster looming in the future. But it's really good to remember at this point something we've been saying since the beginning of this series. These characters give us snapshots. They are the little story arcs that make up the larger story. Josiah has been seeking the God of his ancestor David, and what he also hears conceivably in the reading of Deuteronomy is that the story's not over till it's over. Even though the consequences of unfaithfulness are fierce and the people of God will experience them, the door is always open to return to relationship. Always. Listen to this. In the future, when you experience all these blessings and curses I have listed for you, and when you are living among the nations to which the Lord your God has exiled you, take to heart all these instructions. 
if at that time you and your children return to the Lord your God, and if you obey with all your heart and all your soul all the commands I have given you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes. He will have mercy on you and gather you back from all the nations where he has scattered you. Even though you are banished to the ends of the earth, the Lord your God will gather you from there and bring you back again. Josiah's episode is not the end of the story for God's people. Even their coming defeat by the Babylonians and the exile isn't going to be the end of the story because the option to return is always there in covenant relationship with God. Even now. Because God does not abandon God's people. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And it was the hearing of scripture that drew Josiah and the people into renewed relationship with God and into hope. So here we are in the world in front of the text. And imagine you discovered a moving box years later and pulled out this Bible, this book of the law and of covenant life. Would it do for you what it did for Josiah and the people of God? Would it remind you to return and draw back and draw you back into renewed relationship with God and with others? Is that what you hear? Our wholehearted returns, friends, they still matter. Jesus' ministry continued the call to repentance. Yeah? Because it clears the way to experience right relationship. Repentance makes space in me for right relationship with God and with others and with ourselves. Reconciliation only comes through honesty and taking responsibility. We're learning that, right? As Allison reminded us through the story of David last week. We're stuck with a God who won't abandon us. That's the good news. And our returns matter. Is that how you tell the story of God? So by now, you have realized that I am a bit nerdy. And I think this book is magnificent. I do like books a lot, but I think this one is special. Learning how to read it, study it, pray it, chew on it, wonder at it, wrestle with it, meet God in it. This is the gift of delight God has given us. But it's a book that disrupts as much as it settles. And its meaning can feel hidden in genres and vernacular and patterns and styles that befuddle us. And many of us don't read it for these reasons. And I guess that kind of makes sense. But I want to encourage us today not to give up on Scripture. We need it to reveal God to us and to point us to return. You know, I teach a, a ministry and spirituality class for college-age students. And this is actually a conversation that comes up pretty regularly. I ask them at the beginning of the year how they are hoping their relationship with God will change over their year in our program. And one of the common responses I get is, I don't really like reading the Bible, but I think that should probably change. And some of you are maybe also in that place. 
And I have found myself in that place too. And here are the two ways I commonly respond to this. First, scripture invites our curiosity. Do you know that your questions matter? And cultivating our curiosity about scripture is a good step towards finding life in exploring scripture. So what questions do you have? What captures your attention? What frustrates you? What interests you? Which characters would you most want to be like? And why? Practice being curious about scripture. Let it stir your sense of wonder at the story of God and see where that takes you. And second, we can't manufacture desire. So if you don't want to read scripture, then my question to you would be, do you want to want to? And if the answer to that is yes, then ask God for it. Ask God for the desire to read scripture. Ask God to break down whatever barriers are holding you back. It is God who gives us the desire for God. We don't even come up with that on our own. Lots of things in our lives get in the way of our desire for God. So ask God for that desire. Discovering scripture, the word of God, the story of God, the revelation of God who became flesh because God refused to abandon the people who bear God's name. Scripture is a magnificent gift. Josiah came face to face with scripture and knew how to respond. Let's practice reading and hearing with our minds and our hearts and our bodies until our first instinct is to hear and respond to God too.